Good morning, everyone. Happy Monday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. Hope you had a fantastic weekend. Uh, it's good to be back with you as always. And by the way, thank you so very much for the wonderful feedback that I'm getting. And by the way, <coughs> uh, now this is not a complaint, mind you, but they're getting to be so many comments uh, on my YouTube and I do, look, I don't have time. Literally, I do not have time to respond to every one of them. However, uh, one of you, my viewers, uh, you and I, I believe you're a dispensationalist, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but we but we started off having a really, really excellent conversation. You were very kind. You were very gracious. You were very thoughtful in your remarks. You made a comment on the subjunctive of Matthew chapter 24, uh, you know, in verse 15. I completely lost track of that conversation. I do apologize. Uh, I haven't responded, not because I didn't want to, but because, like I said, they're getting to be so many comments, which is a wonderful thing. But I, I did. I lost complete track of that. So if you would, uh, contact me again, because I'd like for us to continue our conversation. I, I, I truly enjoy, I truly appreciate very thoughtful, very respectful uh, people who take a different position, and we can engage in, uh, in respectful, collegial uh, dialogue. It, it, that's what helps things along always. So if that was you, get in touch with me again. Okay, we are continuing our study of the Olivet Discourse. We have been focused on Matthew chapter 25, 14, and following. And we have here what is known as the parable of the absent master. I have suggested to you that this parable, along with the other parables of Jesus, that, that contain the motif of the absent master, i.e. Matthew chapter 21, uh, the parable of the vineyard with the absent master, etc., that all of these serve as the foundation for all New Testament teaching on the return on the second coming of Christ. That's why it's so critically important that I spend the time in, in correlating and conflating all of these other passages of Scripture that are directly, not indirectly, but directly related to the concept of the return of the absent master and the purpose of the return of Christ at his second coming. Well, over the last few weeks, I've been sharing with you the importance of Daniel chapter 9 in regard to the return of the absent master. I understand and I appreciate the fact Daniel chapter 9 does not speak of, quote, the coming of the Lord. Doesn't have to. If it speaks of those constituent elements that would take place at the time of the coming of the Lord, then guess what? The coming of the Lord is there. That's just proper hermeneutic. It's proper logic. So, when Daniel chapter 9 foretold that 70 weeks are determined to put away sin, make the atonement, finish the transgression, seal, vision, and prophecy. And like I said, that, that, that alone is absolutely incredibly important. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, to bring in everlasting righteousness and anoint the most holy. The fact is that those constituent elements are nothing but, nothing less than, the prediction of the establishment of the kingdom, the coming of the Lord, the judgment, and the resurrection. Oh, I, forgot, I left out finished transgression, which means to fill up the measure of their sin. So, here we have Daniel chapter 9. Now, listen to me very carefully. By any consideration, by any consideration, we must at least consider the fact that the 70 weeks would end at the destruction of Jerusalem. Why? Because 70 weeks and every all six constituent elements of verse 24 are determined upon your people and the holy city, etc. Many attempts are, are made to try to put the fall of Jerusalem outside of <coughs> outside of the 70 weeks. But it says 70 weeks are determined to do these things and included in that is the fate of the city. Now, <coughs> <coughs> pardon me, 
probably on Wednesday of this week, I'm going to be looking at that claim. And I'm going to show you that that claim will not work. It simply will not work to say, well, yeah, 70 weeks are determined upon your city, but all it really means is that the fate of the city would be determined within the 70 weeks, but that the actual destruction would take place 40 years after the fate of the city was determined. That's not tenable. It's not defensible. It won't work. But today, <clears throat> and you know, last Thursday I shared with you that Daniel chapter 9 is in fact paradigmatic. I mean, it's determinative for determining the time of the return of the absent master, Matthew 25 and verse 14. For instance, Daniel 9 is about the judgment, right? Matthew 25, 14 is about the judgment of the servants. So there's, there is no dichotomy here. So we focused last week on the fact, Daniel 9, verse 24 says, 70 weeks are determined to put away sin. Now, once again, I understand that most people try to say, well, sin was put away at the cross. That simply does not work. I shared with you why. And that is that although Christ's sacrifice was certainly the, uh, the ground and the basis for the putting away of sin, the application of that work was not consummated until the return of the absent master, Romans chapter 11. But you see, as I pointed out last week, and folks, please, if you, if you, don't, if you didn't grasp it then, go back and watch that video again and again <clears throat> until the point of that video really hits home. <clears throat> All right? The Redeemer shall come out of Zion, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sin. So the taking away of Israel's sin would be at the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord out of Zion. By the way, just the motif of the coming of the Lord out of Zion is a judgment, is a judgment bit of terminology. All you have to do is go to the Psalms and see that. And by the way, Psalms 14 is one of those texts about the coming of the Lord for the salvation of Israel, i.e. of Romans chapter 11. So the coming of the Lord out of Zion is a judgment context. Here in Romans chapter 11 is the coming of the Lord out of Zion to take away Israel's sin. But it would be the coming of the Lord out of Zion to take away Israel's sin in fulfillment of Isaiah 27. Isaiah 27, as I proved last week, guess what? The time of the judgment of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Now, next point. Paul also quotes in Romans 11, 27, from Isaiah chapter 59. This is my covenant with them when, when <clears throat> I take away their sin. So, the taking away of sin which, which occurs at the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 55, mortals shall put on immortality. <clears throat> when? Resurrection. When? When sin, that is the sting of death, would be removed. Sin, the sting of death, would be removed at the resurrection, which is the return of the absent master. Follow that? See, that's easy. It's logical, it's consistent, it's harmonious, and it's correct. So, the taking away of sin, Romans chapter 11, is linked with, would be the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 59. Now, got to hurry here. Isaiah 59 breaks itself down into three easy headings. <clears throat> Number one. Accusation. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2, the Lord speaks to Israel, and this is all a last day's prophecy. Isaiah 59 is cited, quoted, alluded to several times in the New Testament. But here the Lord speaks of Israel, and he says, Your iniquities have separated you from your God. 
your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear for your hands are defiled with blood. Three times, three times in verses 1 through 7 and 8, the accusation is leveled against Israel of them being guilty, they would be guilty, <clears throat> of shedding innocent blood and other sins as well. So point number one, accusation. Point number two, acknowledgement. In verse 9 and following, Israel acknowledges their sin, but here's the absolutely incredible thing about it. They never repent. They do not repent. You find no words of repentance in verses 9 through 15. Not a word. They just simply said, yeah, uh, uh, justice is far from us. Uh, righteousness does not overtake us. Uh, we are as blind men groping for the wall. Uh, yeah, that's us. Point number three. Action. Oh, by the way, uh, I should point out that in verse 12, our transgressions are multiplied before you and our sins testify against us for our transgressions are with us. And as for our iniquities, we know them in transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing from the Lord, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering uh, from the heart words of falsehood. Justice is turned back. They acknowledge their sin. But I want you to notice that it has to do with the filling up of the measure of sin. Do you remember Daniel chapter 9? Seventy weeks are determined to finish the transgression. Here is Isaiah, which was long before Daniel, which probably serves the ground for Daniel, saying that at this period of time, Israel would fill up the measure of their sin. Got to hurry. Verse 15. Truth fails. The one who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. So guess what? The Lord would take action. Accusation, acknowledgement, action. Now watch this. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation for him. Is Romans 11 about salvation? Is Romans 11, 26 and 27 about salvation? Of course it is. Now watch. And his own righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing. He was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, the coastlands he will fully repay. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The Redeemer will come out of Zion and to those who turn from right transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them and my spirit which who is upon you, and my words which I have put in their mouth, your mouth, shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants, descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forever. Isaiah 59 is the time of the taking away of Israel's sin. You know what? I, I'm, I'm out of time today. Um, as usual, <laughs> kind of got on a roll. Listen, don't forget, my uh, September, October, very, very special, three-book special. Uh, I did something with the book, Seal Up Vision and Prophecy, 70 Weeks Are Determined for the Resurrection and the Elements, oh, excuse me, Elijah, sorry about that, Elijah has come a solution for Romans 11. 25 to 27. If you bought these books separately and paid separate shipping, it would cost you 60 bucks. For September and October, U.S. orders only, total delivered price, $39.95. Go to my website, beautiful banner right up at the very top of the page. Just click on it, and it'll take you right through it. If you're out of the US, continental U.S., and you would like to order this special, contact me, and I'll be able to sell you these books. They are on Kindle, by the way, so take advantage of that. Uh, I, I, can't, 
I can't bundle the offer on Kindle. At least I don't think I can. But anyway, uh, do this and save yourself $20. Now, tomorrow I'm going to finish up on Isaiah chapter 59. So you don't want to miss it. I'll see you on the flip side.